no uh, ask questions about how much knowledge that you've got about black grouse if you've seen them. So basically, I haven't got that ability tonight. So basically, I'm gauging this as a level of there'll be some experts in the audience. There'll be people that probably don't know very little about black grouse. So this talk tonight is pitched at a varying number of levels it gives a, a, a quite an in-depth background to black grouse at the beginning and it then moves on to the work that we've been doing on black grouse in northern england since i started in the late 1990s to stem the decline of black grouse and uh, increase range and get them back into to former haunts uh, one of those being the Boland Fells. Uh, so the talk tonight, three basic uh, things that we'll be looking at. One is a background about black grouse. Secondly is the conservation work that's been done to date. And the third aspect of the talk is more specifically about what's been happening in Boland and why Boland in the last 30 years since black grouse were lost has moved up the conservation agenda. Now, you'll all see my first slide on the screen. Uh, those black dots in that field are not carrion crows. Uh, if you go north from Boland and you see black dots in meadows uh, in the North Pennines and Yorkshire Dales, often they will be black, black grouse. And those black dots in that meadow there are all males. And you tend to see black grouse as groups of males or females and you don't see them as pairs and that site there is one of the closest populations now to Boland and that is the top of uh, I even I've forgotten top of Widdale uh, so that's some of the closest birds that there is to Boland at the moment now black grouse are famous specifically for for their lecking behavior. And there are one of, there's only Capercaillie that also lek in, in the UK. It's a, a pretty distinct form of mating. All the males gather at these sites known as leks, which are traditional in nature, uh, first thing in the morning. And they're gathering basically nearly all the way through the year. Uh, but the key period is April and May because that's when females come to select a mate. And the picture that I've shown you is a typical North Pennines leg. That's one in Upper Teesdale. It's got uh, six cocks on it there. A leg can be anything in recent years between one single male all by himself to the biggest that I saw in 2018 was 42. And you see 42 birds all together. It is something, a sight to behold. The birds go mad. Now, they, 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 they fly in at first light. And they stay for, in April and May, approximately at least an hour, but usually vacate the lek site by seven o'clock. So you've got to be up early to see these birds. Uh, the lek site is a fantastic thing to watch. It's very, very noisy and it's very obvious. Uh, you can hear these birds bubbling and, and spitting on a clear morning for two kilometers away. So. If you've got black grouse present, this is the way we survey them because they're pretty easy to find. They gather at these traditional sites on a regular basis and make an awful racket. Now, the males are gathering there and you can see on this picture, if I show you the arrows, is that these two males are in the middle and one of those two will be the dominant male. And it's probably taken him four or five years to take up this position. They gather every morning and each male, if you watch these legs, has his own patch. So he'll look every day, he'll come here. He'll be in the same patch tomorrow. And these two will be there. They've all got a distinct patch. And normally when I'm giving this talk, I wander around the room to give people a, a feel for how big a territory is, but it's about two square meters. And the whole aim of a male's life is to take that central position. So you tend to find on the edges, uh, first year males or the older males that have got kicked out and the fittest boys are in the middle. Uh, Lek is Norse for play. Now in Yorkshire dialect, which is my part of the world. Sorry, I know you lot of Lancashire, the, the wrong side of the, the fence. But when I was a kid growing up, it was 
we always went laking about and le lek or lekking is looks like play uh, is Norse for play but it's actually a very important part of a black grouse biology females totally different to males uh, they fly into the lek to select a mate and they're flying in and coming in and visiting in uh, late April early May is the, the key period when females come and visit and they're only selecting if I go back I don't know I can't go back one but they're going in and they're selecting the the man in the middle and you will actually see on the bigger legs females actually waiting and, and basically queuing for the the male in the middle the dominant male will secure 90 95 percent of all matings so you can have lex 42 males uh but only one or two in the middle are, are doing most of the mating uh, and the bigger lex attract more females because the females obviously tend to know that the better males the fitter males are at the bigger lex uh, females after mating go away and, and breed in, in the locality and males have nothing whatsoever to do with any brood rearing duties at all. So you never see pairs of black grouse with their young. You'll see grey hens with their young. The males just uh, have a little lads club, gentlemen's club after lecking where they're all together but they have no, no responsibilities whatsoever with, with brood rearing. Now black grouse, they are known as a woodland grouse and when I was growing up and looking at pictures uh, and reading bird books, you always saw black grouse or the old, some of the old fantastic paintings by Thorburn et, et al is that you see black grouse s sitting in birch woodland. Uh, so they're known as a, a woodland grouse and this is a picture of typical habitats that you'd find in Perthshire. This area here supports a very good uh, black grouse lek and they're using all habitats that you can see here with exception of the mature forestry at the back but uh, this provides winter food breeding in these willow scrub birch scrub areas on the edges of the heather so that's this is what I would term typical highland Scotland habitat another type of habitat that you find black grouse strongly associated with and I'll touch on this later in my presentation with some of the last uh, populations in Boland is that they love uh, new woodlands whether it be uh, commercial Sitka spruce plantations like here in the right hand corner and then this again from Highland Perthshire is more new native woodland planted and they love these these are really attractive to hens in the first uh, five to ten years after planting but as soon as the canopy closes uh, black grouse are lost or displaced so they're moved out of it they basically like it when you take the grazing off or you ploughed it to plant the trees and it creates fantastic conditions for for black grouse and a lot of the booms in black grouse populations seen in the 60s and 70s were associated with a lot of the planting that went on in that period. Uh, Keel the forest in England is a, a, a big fantastic example of that is that black grouse were shot as a pest when they first planted these forests they were so abundant uh, but as soon as a when the canopy closes you actually lose them and within Keel the forest now the black grouse are extinct so they only like these forests in the early stages and one of the things one of the, the issues that we have with black grouse conservation is that they're known as a woodland grouse woodland is important to them but this is a picture from upper Teesdale in County Durham where I'm from and it's a question I usually pose to the audience about what is different about that picture when you've seen the two previous uh, but I hope you can pick up on that but there's only two trees and Teesdale and Upper, uh, Upper Teesdale there's actually more tree cover in the city of Westminster in London than there is in the North Pennines but here we have some of the highest densities of, of black grouse anywhere you'll find in their European range and here they're using every habitat that you can see within that picture 
so they winter up on the heather and this is some heather at low altitude that they're also using the breeding in this white ground habitats here and these hay meadows here are traditional old-fashioned species rich hay meadows with a lake cut they are not uh, the more modern agricultural settings of monocultures of of, uh, of ryegrass these are the old-fashioned hay meadows and black grass spend an awful lot of time feeding on these old meadows and also bringing their broods into them so they're using everything that you can see on that picture unlike the close well close cousin red grouse which predominantly live on on heather uh, black grouse need heather Heather is, is a fundamental component of their diet, both hens and males. That is the main food source for them in the winter months. Uh, females, more so than males, because males will, will spend more time feeding on meadows and pastures on the, on the hill fringe. Cotton grass is a key food source in the early spring, gets them into good breeding condition, uh, a critical uh, dietary requirement particularly for hens in the early spring going into breeding bilberry something that we don't really have in the north pennines uh, but in scotland birds will feed a lot on we've lost a lot of our bilberry due to historic uh, sheep grazing we you don't you have to spend a lot of time trying to find bilberries to have bilberry pie in where i, I live in teesdale it's not a common plant like it is in the highlands of scotland and also tree cover uh, you'll see black grouse feeding on berries buds all through the autumn and winter uh, and you'll see some pictures that I have uh, of birds using these habitats so they need a bit of everything uh, hens go off and breed by themselves they're nesting later than red grouse and they're more akin to grey partridges in their uh, breeding requirements they're nesting in May and they're hatching in June so they're a good month later than red grouse uh, in northern England most of the nests are in rushes with some in heather so they're using that white grass zone as their predominant breeding habitats but in Scotland most of the nests will be in tall heather willow scrub etc when they they hatch, their clutch sizes are anything between 6 and 11. Uh, they're incubating for 26 days, so a long time concealed in vegetation. And when their chicks hatch, they require lots and lots of these. Uh, high dependence on lots of insects, particularly sawfly larvae. Um, so when they hit chicks hatch in June, they require insects for the first two to three weeks of their life. And that's a major limiting factor for them is enough food in that period and their their hatch is literally the same as grey partridges and the two species in upland uh, upland northern england uh, their chicks are very similar feeding on very similar things what eats them uh, well in northern england nest predators are one of our main ones is actually stoats weasels and rats uh, this is even though many of our birds are now associated where there's there is gamekeepers on the edges of moorland with predator control operating uh, but they tend to not kill the adult but they will uh, take all the eggs uh, scotland uh, foxes are much more of a, an issue than here because we have very low densities of foxes and then in the winter months peregrines will will take them and crows will take eggs if they're given the opportunity now it's quite i find it quite fascinating at how common black grouse once were and i had an archaeologist ring me last week she was desperate to get hold of some black grouse because she was struggling to identify uh, carcasses within old roman digs at west auckland castle and she was desperate to get some skeletons so she could she thinks that a lot of the the remnants in these old digs are actually black grouse carcasses which would fit because these are a, a very fine table bird and were eaten 
uh, widespreadly and, and harvested in big numbers in the 1800s and early 1900s. It's, if you look back at some of the old books from the, the borders, the Scottish borders and North Northumberland, uh, they used to harvest more black grouse than red grouse in the late 1800s, 1900s. Uh, the, the day bag record, shooting bag record, is actually 262 black grouse were shot in one day uh, in, at Cannock Chase in Staffordshire in 1870. In the same period in the Scottish borders, they shot 1,500 individuals on one estate in the Scottish Highlands, in, in, sorry, in the Scottish borders. Uh, these are huge numbers when now there's only a thousand males left in England. So to shoot 260 in one day, how many was there? Uh, similarly for the Scottish borders, there's less than a thousand males left in the Scottish borders and to shoot 1,500 in one season, these birds were staggeringly common. And now they are a very rare bird. So the, the real peak for these birds seemed to have been in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And if you look at more recent data, the last national survey in 2005, there was 5,000 males still remaining in the UK. Two thirds of those in Scotland. So you've got 3,000 up here. England here, broadly 1,000. And in Wales, it's down to approximately 200. Uh, but most of those are actually on one more in this northeastern corner. And in the 1990s, there was 25,000 males estimated in England. So they've been in a, a long-term decline for over 100 years. And you can see here that they were present in the 60s, Dartmoor and Exmoor, it's so far south, I, I can't remember which way round it goes, Quantock Hills, South Wales. But previous to that, they were present in every county in lowland England, uh, associated with patches of dwarf heath uh, and heather moorland at, at low altitude. So they're even present in the New Forest down here and also on Hampstead Heath in London. But they've been pushed north. And where we, we are, where the, the, the key focus of interest of this talk is the Bowland Fells here, which is right on the southwestern edge of the current distribution of black mouse in northern England. Now, I was been working looking at the distribution of black grouse in Boland and how they were distributed. And there was a very interesting report that was passed to me by Pete Wilson at UU, one of my first visits down to uh, Boland. And it was a report that was commissioned in 1992-93 where uh, somebody, if you read it, he had a, a very miserable winter. It was obviously a cold wet one and he, he surveyed him and his compatriots surveyed a lot of the habitats and interviewed lots of people in Boland to see where black grouse had been and how many numbers were still present because they were concerned that they were, were disappearing rapidly. And when I extracted information from it, these are the blue dots, are the, the historic lek sites that came from that about how black grouse were distributed in the 1990s and earlier. Uh, around the Boland Fells, which is what I would expect, to be honest with you. It's, it's very typical of how black grouse, and you'll see in later slides, is that black grouse tend to be leks around the edges of heather moorland. And typically in good, good habitats, so about two kilometers apart. So that sort of distribution is what I would expect. But this is quite interesting is that black grouse were, seriously quite well very seemingly very abundant in this in the 50s and 70s and the key places seem to be these plantations Thrushgill, uh, Gisborne Forest and High Grains and black grouse really th flourished in these new plantations because what they would, did at the time was that they planted more fringe habitats created wonderful habitats and black grouse would have been pulled into these but as soon as canopy closes they've gone they're displaced so 
they created fantastic habitats at the end before black grouse and seemingly lecking males were absent by 2000 and as far as i'm aware is that there's only been sporadic sightings of birds through the winter months in 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 years since so why have they declined well that's two pictures uh, this is a picture of Gisborne Forest. This is typical moor fringe habitats here in the foreground. And when that was planted, it would have been wonderful for them. But as soon as that canopy closes, there's no habitat for black grouse and it's also full of things that eat them. So you can't manage for black grouse within that. They like moorland with a few trees and not a forest. So it becomes, this becomes unsuitable. Long-term reasons for their decline is that we've lost since the war second world war lots and lots of heather moorland habitats and more fringe habitats due to changes in agriculture through that time black grouse like old-fashioned farming on the hill fringe with gamekeeping and if you lose that old-fashioned farming you lose the mosaic of habitats that they like and they get, they just gradually get pushed out so that's a very rapid background to black grouse but unless you've got a bit of a feel for the background to them you can't move forward to how we restore numbers now when i first started in the late 1990s uh there was a real aim specific conservation aim in northern england was to stem the decline they were declining at 10 percent per annum in the 1990s and the way they were going they'd be extinct today if they carried on in that rage that rate uh, so there was a lot of interest from various conservation bodies to stem the decline. Uh, the UK bat process started in 1999 and black grouse were one of the key species under the umbrella of the UK Biodiversity Action Plan with funding associated with it to actually do something about it. Now, the GWCT is predominant predominantly a research charity and before you can start putting conservation actions in in place you've got to find out what on earth is going wrong and i don't get a company car i get two company pointers uh specifically we use them for finding black grouse broods to see how well they're breeding uh the other research that we do is lots of let counts so in April and May, we uh, go around the countryside finding leks. These leks are traditional in nature. They don't tend to move. All males are there. So counting males is a wonderfully consistent way of monitoring the population. But it's no good for females. Uh, in the last national survey in 2014, we counted 1,437 males at leks, but we only saw 100 females. Uh, females just come in and go away so you can't count hens at lex so you need to find hens if you want to know more about hens in late summer so in july and august with pointing dogs to look how they're bred and it, to find out more in uh intense or studies of black grouse to see how they move what's eating them how well they're breeding is radio tracking studies and we also use the pointing dogs to to catch poults and the dog holds them on points and then you drag a net over and you can catch poults, fit them with radio tags and that allows us then to follow birds and find out much more in-depth information on how black mouse are doing and what they are using in the environment. That's a picture, that's a trick picture, but that's uh, basically me uh, looking for red grouse in that scenario but and that's how the pointing dogs work they go on point and you flush the the birds and count them as they go away now from this research there's some pretty key information that we've we've found out over the last 20 years we're in a, a good place regarding what we know about black grouse is that our radio tracking studies have allowed us to find out information on how long birds live for what we know from this is that adults live a very long time uh, their, their survival rates are much higher than what we see in scotland 
and in Wales. And we put this down to the fact that in Northern England, 95% of our remaining birds now are associated where, with the edges of grouse moors, uh, where there's full-time gamekeepers operating. So they have a, a protection from predators, which they, they benefit from. So they, they live a long time. And these black dots here are the leks. And you can see the predomination of leks here. This is the actual tees. Sorry, that's the, the Weir Valley. And then this is the tees and the Tyne. So this area here, the North Pennines A and B, three valleys here have 80% of our birds. Uh, so that's a real heartland for black grouse. And, but the problem we have with black grouse in Northern England is that they don't breed very well. Uh, despite the protection of gamekeepers, these birds breed on the more fringes, on farmland, on the edges of the grouse moors. And what limits them is they actually don't breed very well. On average, 1.3 chicks per hen. So to increase numbers, we simply have to get them breeding better, but maintain these high rates of adult survival. Now, what we also know about them from radio tracking studies and looking at leks is that these leks are distributed in a landscape and in good habitats. So this is Upper Teesdale. They're approximately two kilometers apart and each one is basically associated with a hill farm. So you've got Heather Grouse Moor at the top, breeding in these rough grazing allotments, lecking on the edge and feeding in the meadows. But it's key because of movements of birds, which I'll talk about in a minute, that these leks are connected. It's no good having good habitat for one lake if it's not connected to another. And that's a massive uh, problem when conserving black grouse and also trying to expand them into former areas is this need for connectivity in the landscape. And this is big conservation issues for a whole range of different species. And it moves up the agenda as time goes on that you've got to conserve things at large landscape levels. And we're fortunate here with the North Pennines, AOMB, connected to the Yorkshire Dales, to Boland, that we do have actually a, a relatively connect, uh, connected large landscape, which is big enough to conserve species like black grouse. Now, one of the problems that we have, we, we said that I said before that adult survival is good, and it is typically very, very high, but the, this is affected by severe winters. And the last severe winter we had was in 0910, and we had four months of snow in Upper Teesdale. There was skiing up in the Upper Dale for four months, and it dropped and it froze. And the red grouse abandoned, but the black grouse didn't. They decided that sitting it out was the best strategy. And you'll see from this picture that there is literally no trees, and the stupid birds starved. Uh, there were, we found bodies the next spring. Uh, they'd just not moved and, and died because all their food was covered by frozen snow. So we lost 35% of our birds over that winter. Interestingly, in Scotland, where there's more woodland in a home range, black grouse were totally unaffected by the winter of 0910. So in the per intervening period, we've been trying to encourage more woodland cover. So this is a picture uh from Arkengarfdale of some woodland that's been established but it's important to realize that they only require small pockets of woodland uh this is a a big fear of mine currently is that the drive to plant more trees is sadly in many areas taken too far and black grouse like uh, a landscape with some trees in it but not too many. And if you go into Scotland, you will see now there is a massive drive and people think that getting more trees is wonderful, but sadly in many cases it is mainly commercial Sitka spruce woodland that is going in and you cannot mitigate uh, for black grouse if you're going to plant 200 hectares of Sitka spruce plantation. Uh, you cannot maintain enough open habitats to retain black grouse in that landscape and you have to accept that you will have a boom but then you will lose them and this is 
a big concern of mine currently uh, in the UK. The other thing about black grouse from radio tracking them is that males don't tend to move very far. I showed you earlier those leks. These leks are the birds on leks. The males are highly related. Uh, you will have father on there and you tend to get all his sons joining in him uh, around that because they just tend to the males just join the local lek. Females on the other hand all disperse and they're going at least nine kilometers up to 30 and in Scandinavia have been recorded going even further than that and the females are doing that so they don't interbreed with their father and brothers at the local lek. So that means in a general term is that black grouse born in Upper Teesdale all the hens are leaving and they're going into the neighboring valleys uh, to settle and mate with unrelated males. So it means on the edge of the range uh, you've got hens moving into areas where there's no males and for instance if people in Boland I would expect people to see hens rather than males when you're on the edge of the range. <clears throat> now some of the research that we've been doing to try and and this is old research now to try and increase numbers is to get black grass breeding better and some of the early work was simply looking at uh, with a changing agricultural policy at the time from headage payments to restoring heather moorland was to look at what benefits uh, sheep grazing reductions to improve heather moorland had on black grouse and this is for the old countryside stewardship schemes that many in the audience may remember and what we saw from these grazing reductions is that black grouse benefited greatly in the early years from them they bred better than control sites where grazing remained unchanged and you saw local booms in leks if you carry this on and i should do this is that unfortunately this doesn't go on forever and if you get large areas of rank grassland you actually see then a decline again and you have to reinstate management and so they do they're a bird of a boom and bust so a complex bird to manage for uh, we know what they want they require these fine scale mosaics and when we look at this we tend to put a one a one kilometer or a one and a half kilometer radius around the central lake and you have tend to within that have all the habitats that they're using and so they have some heather moorland some majority rough grazing grass moor there'll be some meadows and there'll be a tiny amount of woodland and that's a mix of habitats that are required throughout the year to support a lekking group. But it's important that that is connected to the next bit. It's no good having one wonderful piece of habitat on a farm if it's not connected to the neighbour doing the same thing. <clears throat> so in the good old days when funding was, we thought it was tight at the time, but there used to be quite a lot of money for conservation. There doesn't seem to be a lot now. But between 1996 and 2011, we had a full-time project officer employed. These partners at the bottom were, always, were all chipping in to employ a full-time project officer. And basically over that period, uh, they were employed to provide free advice to land managers and landowners and any interested parties. So all the estates basically in that North Pennines, Yorkshire Dales area and farmers were the large areas were all received a visit during that period and they were encouraged to take up a suite of management prescriptions so a very favorite one is planting gill woodlands we'll all will have seen these going in everywhere uh, some have been very good some have been unsuccessful but at the end of the day it's in many cases even if the trees haven't taken the grazing exposure itself can be very valuable to black grouse We've seen grazing reductions on the hill fringe. And we've also seen some very dramatic changes to some of our forests in the North Pennines, particularly where this here was a 300 hectare Sitka spruce woodland planted at high altitude, which was removed by the landowner and has been restored to Heather Moorland up here. And then you'll see all this new native woodland has been restored on neighboring ground and down the valley so here black grouse were actually absent 
uh, but are now recolonised because they have got we got a double win. We got restoration of Heather Moreland and we got new woodlands planted. So this was brilliant. And so there's lots of very positive things gone in and there's been huge changes in habitats quality throughout the North Pennines and Yorkshire Dales range over the last 20 years, uh, at a landscape scale, which black grouse have benefited from. And what we've seen is that we've done national surveys of black grouse in these years. This is counting males at Lex, 1998, 2002, 2006. And you'll see the numbers increasing from the, the low of 773 males in 98, up to 1,029 in 2006. But what we weren't seeing is much change in range. Is that we've seen a big consolidation in this North Pennines area but not any real range expansion. This was great because our fundamental objective was to stop the things declining and disappearing. So the key thing was to get numbers stabilized and increasing. So this was all very positive. And from 2006, the project moved into a new phase where we were looking at expanding the range, which is pretty novel when working with black grouse. And even today when black grouse are still declining in many parts of Scotland and Wales, uh, we're looking at trying to expand range and what we did was look at where we could potentially achieve this uh, we couldn't go this way to the northeast because basically there's no habitat and the North York Moors are too far away couldn't really go into the Lake District because habitat quality is there's bits of decent habitat, but it's too fragmented. And a key thing in that part of the world is that there's very little predator control going on. North into North Northumberland, well, we have a big issue here with the key zone that connects these populations to the north is we've got Kielder. And this is now a forest, not moorland with a few trees. And to recreate black grouse habitats within that uh, is just unfeasible. Uh, financially. Uh, so the key area that we've been looking at is is south because what we have south here is we've got this very similar North Pennines network of moorland habitats with traditional hill farming all around the edges and you'll see Boland here and you've also got gamekeeping. So you've got what we have here extending into this area. So what we've been looking at is expanding south into the Yorkshire Dales because what we have here is landscape scale connectivity and an infrastructure of predator control but what we found is uh, is range is potentially limited by males not moving very far so what you see on the edge of the range is you've got hens coming out into marginal habitats in not marginal edge habitats in the winter months but then they go back again uh, because there's no males to hold them and also in 2006 is in the core of the range we had some lots of estates with big lakes over 20 birds where you've actually got a surplus of males which are basically not really doing a lot uh, where we could take them and see whether we could stimulate range expansion on this edge by wild translocation so we started this in 2006 uh, over a long period up until 2014. So two phases. And this was all developed uh, with the project partners following our UCN guidelines and also through a Natural England license to move birds. And the criteria that we use was uh, only big lecks, 10 plus lecking males, stable or increasing numbers, no more taking no more than two from any lek and only in good breeding years so not to impinge on our core populations uh, the release sites had to be within range of dispersing hens because we we're only moving males had to have suitable habitats predator control and minimal human disturbance so this is a release site in in Nidderdale which looks very similar to the Pennine sites how do we do it well we caught males by lamping at night uh, you watch them into roost and then you dazzle them with a light, play a tape recording, catch them in a butterfly net, uh, 
and then put them in a carry box, transport them immediately to the release site and re hard release. So they're straight out onto the release site habitat straight away. So there's no uh, penning at the other end, they're straight out. All birds that we release were fitted with tags and located weekly. Now this translocation went over a long period, 2006 to 14. And we, we moved 62 males over that period. You're probably thinking, well, why so few birds over such a long period? Well, we could only move in good breeding years. And typically black grouse breed only well every one or two. So we were restricted by the years that we could do it. Uh, but this doesn't tend to matter because what we've found from tagging the birds is that their survival rates are very high. 77% uh, of birds survive over the winter, the birds that we release. And that's exactly the same as unmoved birds in the core of the range. Uh, the birds that we released displayed at Lex 3. Sorry, I can't see from there. Oops. Back. I don't know that one. Let, uh, displayed at Lex 3.5, 3.6 kilometers from the release area, so they stayed pretty close. But some of them went back into the core of the range. So we had males that went all the way back into core of the range. You went as far as 27 kilometers. The key thing is, though, we did see females in attendance with males, so females did find them. And interestingly, these males moved and often attended historic Lex sites. And they basically starbursted looking for hens. So we were very pleased with this work that we, we did. Uh, these birds found hens and it started to stimulate range expansion on the edge of the range. Uh, we, so we followed this up in 2013 with actually moving females. Is The reason in the beginning we didn't move females is we thought that if you moved them they would just starburst and move everywhere but in contrary to this they didn't move at all uh, we moved 24 females into upper dinderdale where we'd already established males uh, their survival again was very high 81 percent surviving over the winter they stayed incredibly local we didn't lose any that we had none move out of the watershed and you can see from the triangles uh, they stayed and nested very close to where the males were lecking so we actually established this network of leks with associated females pretty quickly so we were very pleased by what we were seeing and the females laid for our clutches the success was very high uh, nesting success was similarly very high but the breeding productivity overall uh, wasn't as, as high as the core of the range over the three years that we followed. But we did have a, a hen that had a brood of six. And in subsequent years, black grouse have bred at the release site since. So they can do it. And so we're, apart from the, the breeding productivity being lower, we were very pleased with what we saw by moving hens. Are birds still there? Yes, we started translocation into areas and four sites in the Yorkshire Dales in 2006. Uh, the last release was in 2014. This black line here is the numbers of males at Lex in the vicinity of these release sites. You can see that they are, they increased up until 2015, but have dropped off. Unfortunately, with COVID, we haven't been able to count all the leks this time, but the key areas we managed to get some counts and they were very similar to last year. And this is put in context with leks in the North Pennines range, which have followed a very similar pattern. And this follows breeding productivity the year before in relation to basically to weather. So they've persisted, albeit low densities. And what we've seen on this edge of the range is that this has helped contribute to, to some range expansion into formerly occupied areas on this southern fringe of the range in the Yorkshire Dales. So between 1998 and 2014, numbers basically doubled in England 
and we're making some progress towards range expansion. So after all that, we finally move Boland up the agenda because prior to this Boland was black grouse had gone from Boland. We were concentrating our efforts further north to where birds are and with transication giving us an, an opportunity to start expanding range when conditions permit we're looking at there's key areas that you can start looking at which are obvious which are consolidation in this Yorkshire Dales Nidderdale area but also potentially Boland and feasibility was is is the first steps that you take to to start looking at this if you look at the IUCN guidelines for any type of work like this, the, the, the key thing you first undertake is a feasibility study. This was funded by partners in the Boland Fells in, back in 2013, where I came and did a pretty uh, intensive study looking at the old information available on black grouse distribution and also field visits to see what was currently available. And from this feasibility study, we found that well, concluded that black grouse were once part of a, con a contiguous north of England population through to settle through this area and also through Ingleborough. Landscape scale habitat improvements implemented over the past 20 years, you'd be all aware of wide scale habitat improvements that have been going on across, across the Boland Fells by all parties. So habitats are much better for black grouse. You see these circles, these are historic leks and other areas that I deemed as potentially suitable for to support lekking groups and we estimated there's potentially space for 21 connected leks which if they all have an average English lek size of six could five or six males I can't do my maths there could support 80 to 105 males uh, but in 2006, the nearest birds to uh, Boland were 30 kilometres away. But with range expansion in the Yorkshire Dales, by 2012, this has increased to 17 kilometres. So it was, it was just on the edge of natural dispersal capacity of birds. Then birds were being seen occasionally, particularly in this northern end, where I would expect to see them. Uh, so the feasibility study conclusions were restoration were dependent on continuing to increase numbers and range in the Yorkshire Dales. Doing more work in this corridor through here and through here to create habitat corridors for birds to naturally re recolonize while in continuing to improve habitats within Boland, particularly at this top end, because that's where natural recolonization will occur. This moved forward further in 2016 because there was further increases in range uh, with the nearest birds to Boland in 2015 only 12 kilometers away so birds are getting closer and also the translocation trial results were starting to come in which showed it is a potential mechanism for for using to recolonize in Boland also at this period in 2014 black grouse numbers in England were at a record level but unfortunately since 2014 we've had a period of successive poor breeding years if you look across here this is breeding productivity chicks per hen per year we've had a number of poor breeding years and the average is one and a half chicks per hen and since 2014 we've had one two three four five out of the last six have been poor breeding years and this has set us back somewhat in our objectives uh, uh, what we would have been trying to achieve with partners so the current situation is uh, we're currently working with our partners on the English Black Grouse Conservation Strategy Group uh, to revise a, a, a document called the Strategic Approach to Delivering Black Grouse Conservation Targets in Northern England, which we've been using since 2010. It's got slightly out of date with the losses of Black Grouse in North Northumberland, but increases in the Yorkshire Dales. So we've been working to improve update that to where we go next with our work doing more in Boland more consol consolidation work in the Yorkshire Dales 
Further work we need to do is to reappraise our project plan for potential work in Boland with the issues with wild translocation being dependent on surpluses at donor moors and recent years we just haven't had that we haven't had birds available for moving but also keeping a better documentation on the changes in numbers in the Yorkshire Dales funding has really dried up for us for people to do surveys it's become much harder to do conservation work uh, before we move forward we would have to get natural England licenses uh, to move forward with work and also these things cost money and in the current economic climate uh, conservation work it becomes more and more difficult to get conservation funding to do uh, active work so just basically in summary and I'm sorry ever, you've had to listen to me for such a long time when England are playing in about a quarter of an hour I believe but the key things that need to be done to restore black grouse to the Bowling Fells. And I, I do really see this as a realistic objective. Things have really moved forward. Uh, but the key thing is you've got, to, you've got to address why they went in the first place. And there's been incredible investment going on along these lines. And it, you've got to have the right habitats, a, a leg scale and a landscape scale. And this has been underway for a long time now. Uh, but there's, there's always things that can be done. The connectivity with the Yorkshire Dales, again, that's similar to the above. It's work that still is ongoing and needs to be done. We still have a problem with black grouse in Northern England is that they don't breed very well. And I've been working on them for 20 years and it's still the, the holy grail. If we could increase breeding success to the four and a half that they produced in 2014, we'd be... Uh, knee deep in black mouse. Uh, so if we could get them to do that every year, wonderful. And translocation is a good mechanism, but it's, it is limited because you're just relying on your donor populations uh, having surpluses. So I hope you all found that interesting and thank you for your time. And I'm more than willing to field questions that you may have.